Hi everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel and today we will be talking about controlling microbial growth in the body and in this case we will be um, dealing with the antimicrobial drugs. Um, to get more information about antimicrobial drugs, these drugs interfere with the life cycle of your organism okay and in in and they interfere in many different ways and to alter the life cycle um all antimicrobials must bind to a cellular target and binding of the drug to its target results is um it will result in the alteration of the normal function of your bacterium or your fungus and that in case will lead to the inhibition of growth or even cell death but before we start let's um, deal with a case study and this case study is entitled a cure leading to a disease Thomas a 63 year old male has been suffering from a persistent cough for the past three weeks it began as a sore throat but quickly it spread to his chest he coughs with a rattling sound in his chest and his dry cough is ineffective it has no phlegm and he eventually visits a doctor and is diagnosed with bronchitis. Dr. Warner prescribes a levofloxacin, an antimicrobial antibiotic for a 10-day course and assures Thomas that he should feel better in a few days. A week later, the cough has largely subsided and Thomas feels much better, or at the very least, his respiratory system feels better. Thomas had cramps in his lower abdomen the day before and his stools were more looser than the usual today the cramping is more severe and he has foul smelling diarrhea he also feels the desire to urinate frequently even when there is nothing to urinate he gets an anti-diarrheal medicine from the pharmacy and spends the remainder of the day in bed Thomas feels bad the next morning. He has a fever, severe cramping, and the diarrhea hasn't stopped. He is concerned that he's acquired food poisoning, so he phones his doctor and arranges an appointment that afternoon. And here are the questions to consider. First, are Thomas' symptoms due to food poisoning? And second, are there other possible explanations for his illness you may comment down your answers on the chat box or even the comment sections below and let's see what will be the answers to these questions as we progress to this case study in the next presentation about antimicrobial resistance but before that let's introduce the history of your antimicrobial um, agents this is or the photo on your background is the German immunologist and Nobel Prize winner Paul Ehrlich in 1854 to 1915. Chemicals that affect the physiology in any manner, such as your caffeine, alcohol, and tobacco, are called drugs. Okay, drugs that act against um, diseases are what we call as your chemotherapeutic agents. An example of this would be your insulin. Okay. It lowers your blood glucose levels, anti-cancer drugs, and drugs for treating infections, and we call them antimicrobial agents or antimicrobials. The subject of this presentation is we will explain the mechanisms by which antimicrobial agents act. What are the factors that, uh, um, that must be considered in the use of antimicrobial agents? And... Um, there are several issues that surround the resistance to microbial antimicrobial agents among these microorganisms. However, um, at the preceding slides, we will begin with a brief history of your antimicrobial chemotherapy. B before we start, we will be meeting these learning outcomes. By the end of this um, short presentation, we will describe the contributions of Paul Ehrlich. Alexander Fleming, Gerard Dumac, and the development of antimicrobials. We will explain how semi-synthetic and the synthetic antimicrobials will differ from antibiotics. There is a backstory 
about this little young girl which lay struggling to breathe as her like parents stood mutely by willing the doctor to do something anything okay they will they asked the doctor to relieve the symptoms that had so quickly consumed their four-year-old daughter's vitality sadly there there was little the doctor could do because the thick pseudomembrane of this diphtheria okay which is composed of bacteria mucus blood clotting factors and white blood cells adhered tenaciously to her pharynx tonsils and her vocal cords he knew that trying to remove it could rem uh, like open the underlying mucous membrane and it will result to bleeding okay possibly additional infections and even death and in 1902 during that time uh, there was a little medical science about the treatment okay that could offer to treat diphtheria all physicians could do was wait and hope on this next image you will see here a diphtheria immunization scheme in london england in 1941 this is a seven year old ronald ford received his diphtheria vaccine at the rgl street school clinic in on the 7th of may 1941 this um, nurse in the middle holds up ronald's sleeve whilst the doctor administers the the injection okay and to continue the story to tell the family members how long a patient would be unwell or when she would die was common practice in the earliest um, 20th century medicine it was very difficult to block pathogens such as your corny bacterium diphtheria okay and change the course of infections even though physicians and scientists had lately recognized the germ hypothesis of disease in fact one third of children born in the early 1900s perished before turning five. That's so sad. To characterize the use of drugs that selectively kill germs while having little or no effect on the patient, Paul Ehrlich proposed the word chemotherapy. He described the magic bullets that would connect to germ receptors and kill them while ignoring the host cells that lack the receptor molecules. Paul Ehrlich's um, antimicrobial research yielded arsenic compounds. One, one of it acted upon your Staphylococcus aureus bacterium and your P. curisol genome fungus and it inhibited its bacterial growth zone. This next image here is um, showing you the antibiotic effect of the mold penicillium chrysogenum and this was done by alexander fleming when he observed that this mold secretes penicillin which inhibits the growth of bacteria with the apparent staphylococcus aureus growing on this blood agar plate so this is your staphylococcus aureus which is a bacterium and um, the fungus the penicillium chrysogenum and the zone of inhibition you can see here that it cleared out okay your penicillium has an anti uh, penicillium uh, chrysogenum has this antibiotic action and this mold will secrete penicillin um, this penicillin will inhibit the, the the bacterial development as seen by your staphylococcus aureus growing on this blood agar plate um, in 1928 this british uh, bacteriologist alexander fleming identified the antibiotic effect of penicillin which is produced by your penicillin this is also um important person to note the gerard domac um a, no a nobel prize in physiology or medicine um, awardee in 1939 um, his uh, notable experience was um, patterned from 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 the world world of uh, bacteriology as um, late before okay although Ehrlich has his arsenic compounds which is like hazardous to humans okay penicillin was not widely available until the late 1940s instead 
sulfanilamide was the first useful antimicrobial or antibacterial drug which is discovered by um, the German chemist Gerard Dumas. Okay. This next image here is um, Dr. Selman Waxman. Okay. Dr. Selman Waxman discovered that uh, other microorganisms, particularly soil dwelling bacteria of the genus Streptomyces, produce antimicrobials. And Waxman invented the term antibiotics to characterize um, naturally occurring antimicrobial substances. And antibiotics are antibacterial agents, which includes uh, synthetic substances, but not antiviral or antifungal agents. Others also created semi-synthetic antimicrobials, which has chemically changed antibiotics, and they are more effective they are last longer, they are easier to administer, and more natural antibiotics. Well, there are synthetic medicines, okay, that are antimicrobials created in the laboratory, and most of the antimicrobials are either semi synthetic or natural. In this next um, table, you will see here the sources of some common antibiotics and semi-synthetics. From the microorganism, which is a fungi, we have here the chrysogenum, this griseo fulvum, and the acrim acrimonium species, which will produce this antimicrobial like penicillin G, griseo fulvin, cephal uh, cephalothin, and the, the corresponding bacteria, this um, species of bacteria will produce this particular antimicrobial. We have here the Amycolaptoptopsis orientalis, your Bacillus lichiniformis, we have your Micromonospora genus, your Pseudomonas, Saccharopolispora, Streptomyces, and many more. So, next, in this section, we will try to learn the mechanism of your antimicrobial action. Antimicrobial agents can be divided into groups and they are based on the mechanism of their antimicrobial activities. The main groups are um, agents that inhi inhibit cell wall synthesis, depolarize the cell membranes, inhibit protein synthesis, inhibit nuclei as nucleic acid synthesis, and also those that are inhibiting the metabolic pathways in bacteria. And the learning outcomes, we will try to explain the principle of selective toxicity and we have to list six mechanisms by which antimicrobial drugs affect pathogens. As from the history earlier, what Ehrlich foresaw was the key to a successful chemotherapy with, uh, against the microbes is what we call as your selective toxicity. Okay, That is, an effective antimicrobial agent must be more toxic to a pathogen than to the pathogen's host. And selective toxicity is possible because of differences in the structure um, or metabolism between the pathogen and its host. Typically, the more differences, the easier is it to discover or create an effective antimicrobial agent. And although they have a lot of variety of effects on your pathogens, antimicrobial drugs can be categorized into several general groups according to their mechanisms of actions. And drugs that inhibit the cell wall synthesis, these drugs are um, selectively toxic to certain fungal or bacterial cells some which have cell walls but not to animals which lack cell walls. Drugs that inhibit protein synthesis, um, particularly the translation process, by targeting the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic chromosomes. There are also drugs that um, disrupt unique components of a cytoplasmic membrane. There are also drugs that um, inhibit the general metabolic pathways not used by humans, drugs that inhibit nucleic acid synthesis, and drugs that block a pathogen's recognition or its attachment to its host. And it was very evident using this um, schematic diagram 
of the the mechanisms of actions of your your microbial drugs so this is your um, inhibition also of cell wall synthesis we'll take a look at the, in a more detailed part here and as we reach the learning outcome we will describe the actions and give examples of drugs that affect the cell walls of bacteria and your fungi remember a cell wall protects a cell from the effects of your osmotic pressure both pathogenic bacteria and um, fungi have cell walls and animals such as humans don't have it first we will examine the drugs that act against the bacterial cell walls bacterial cell wall synthesis and inhibitory effects of your beta uh, beta lactams on it so in your first image this is a schematic depiction of a normal peptidoglycan cell wall showing okay the NAG and the NEM chains and the cross-linked okay NA and uh, cross-linked NAM subunits this is your bacterial cell again um, bacterial cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan which is made up of your NAG and NA NAM chains they're cross-linked by but this this uh, purple here is a cross bridge between the NAM and NEM and NEM and NAG these are um, peptide bridges okay and in letter B this is a bacterium that grows by adding a new um, NAG and NEM subunits and linking new NAM subunits to the older ones um, this two uh, hexagon here okay this is an NAG and this is your new NEM subunits they are inserted into the cell wall by the enzymes and allowing the cell to grow other enzymes also will link the new NEM subunits to old NEM subunits with your peptide crosslink so this purple lines here that um, depict the peptide crosslinks in letter C you'll see this image in the green which are the structural formulas of some beta lactam drugs okay the more evident is your beta lactam ring as shown in the uh, green green squares okay green rings and letter D this is your beta lactam a schematic depiction of the effect of penicillin on the peptidoglycan in preventing your NEM and uh, NEM crosslinks so what what the beta lactam will do is that they interfere with the linking enzymes and your NEM subunits will remain unattached to their to their neighbors however the cell continues to grow as it adds more NAG and NEM subunits and in letter E you will see here the cell that is bursting from osmotic pressure because the integrity of the peptidoglycan is not maintained so the bacteria is again undergoing lysis due to the effects of your beta lactam drug and after the beta lactam weakens the peptidoglycan molecule by preventing NAM NEM crosslinks okay may you know what force actually kills an affected bacterial cell okay you may add your answers to to the description box or to the comment section and we'll go with the inhibition of protein synthesis uh, this is a tube of bacterban which is a medicine okay or generally we call it mupi rosin which is sold in the brand of Bactroban, among others, is a very uh, useful topical antibiotic against superficial skin infections such as your pedigo or your folliculitis. Okay, it is many. Um, it has many different uses, which is getting rid of your methicillin-resistant S. aureus. Okay, when present in the nose without symptoms. And this due to the what we call as your concerns of developing resistance use of it, this uh, bacteroban greater than 10 days is not recommended and we will explain that one in the next video about antimicrobial resistance 
and um, again this green uh, this spectra band is used to uh, use it as a cream or an, an ointment applied to your skin before that um, we will try to uh, meet this learning outcomes we will describe the actions and give examples of the six antimicrobial drugs that interfere with your ribosomes we will describe how your mupirosin interferes with the protein synthesis Generally, you'll see here um, letter, in letter A, we have here an aminoglycosides in orange. And they change the shape of your 30S subunit. And once you change the shape of this 30S subunit, it will cause the incorrect pairing of your tRNA codon, uh, anticodons with the mRNA codons. Okay? In some aminoglycosides, for example, with your streptomycin, it will cause change in the 30S shape, so the MR, mRNA is misread. In letter B, okay, tetracyclines will block this green part here. They will block the tRNA docking site, which is like the A site, okay, or the 30S subunit of your um, 30S subunit of your mRNA, a tRNA. Okay, and preventing the protein elongation. So again, tetracycline oxaponate and letter C, we have here your um, chloramphenicol. Your chloramphenicol blocks the peptide bond formation. They will, they will prevent it from um, attaching here. Okay, and uh, um, the peptide the peptide bonds okay between the amino acids will be um, prevented to form. Letter D, uh, these are uh, what they call as lincosamides or the macro slides. Okay, the macro slides will bind to the 50S subunit and they will block proper mRNA movement through the ribosomes and through ribosome. And again, when, when, when it is the ribosome has been blocked, there is no synthesis. Okay, so again, your macro slides will bind to the 50S subunit. The bigger part of the, the bigger part of your ribosome, and um, preventing the movement of the ribosome along your mRNA. In letter E, there is an antisense nucleic acids that will bind to the mRNA, and when they bind to the mRNA, they will um, block the ribosomal subunits. And in letter F, there is what we call as your oxa, uh, oxazolidazone, okay. Your oxazolidinones inhibit the initiation of translation. So these are the me um, mechanisms by which your antimicrobials target the prokaryotic ribosomes that will stop the protein synthesis. And if there is a um, interference with charging or uh, of your t transfer RNA molecules. Um, again, your topical drug mepirosin will selectively bind to the isoleucyl tRNA synthetase. Okay, this enzyme, this the isoleucyl tRNA synthetase, will load isoleucine in gram-positive bacteria, um, particularly the gen the genus Staphylococcus and the Streptococcus. And this drug is selectively toxic because it does not bind to any. Okay any of the eukaryotic tRNA molecules so they, it acts upon on the prokaryotes only. In the presence of the drug, the gram-positive cells cannot load isoleucine so protein synthesis cannot proceed past isoleucine codons. Thus, meperosin cripples the production of proteins in bacteria. The WHO lists meperosin as an essential medicine for bacterial skin infections that is needed in your basic health system. The next mechanism that we'll try to learn is the disruption of your cytoplasmic membrane. This is an example of um, a bacteria in the background. It's the Brevibacillus brevis, which is a soil bacteria. Okay, and it cr um, the soil bacteria will um, produce, okay, this is an uh, ionophronic antibiotics, germicidin. Okay, or also called as your gramicidin D. This gramicidin D uh, is extracted from the Brevi Bacillus brevis 
okay and they are uh, uh, um, this gramicidins are linear peptides okay they have 15 amino acids and um, they have two isoforms so in this learning outcome we will describe the action of antimicrobial drugs that interfere with the cytoplasmic membranes and um, in disruption of the cytoplasmic membrane by the antifungal amphotericin B you will see here in the first image is a structure of your amphotericin B and in letter B that the proposed action of your uh, um, amphotericin B this amphotericin B will act okay on the molecules of your ergosterol then they will congregate forming a pore so this will like forming a pore here so it will open up okay passageways going in and also we have to take note that this what they call as pyrani, uh, uh, pyrazinamide will disrupt the transport across the cytoplasmic membrane of your mycobacterium tuberculosis okay this is a close-up picture of a mycobacterium tuberculosis culture and revealing this organism organisms colonial morphology this so you can see here in the the growing plates this um, colorless rough surface and they are typical morphological characteristics of your M tuberculosis colonial growth again this pathogen is uniquely activates and accumulates the drug pyrazinamide and the pyrazinamide is the most effective against the intracellular non-replicating bacterial cells and some of the well some of your antiparasitic drugs also act on the cytoplasmic membranes for example praziquantel and ivermectin that will change the permeability of cell membranes of the several types of parasitic worms take note that the ivermectin the ivermectin is um, quite phenomenal because some of uh, the people in the u.s is trying to use the ivermectin as a treatment for covid 19. so there's also a next mechanism by which they inhibit the drugs will inhibit the metabolic pathways these are yeast cells on the background the computer illustration of the budding yeast cells caramizes service e which is known as your baker's yeast okay uh, metabolism metabolism can be defined clearly de as the sum of all the chemical reactions which takes place within the organism and whereas most living things share certain metabolic uh, reactions for example glycolysis other chemical reactions are unique to certain organisms and whenever differences exists between um, the metabolic process of a pathogen and its host anti-metabolic agents can be effective in this presentation we will be explaining the actions of antimicrobials that disrupt the synthesis of your folic acid define the term analog as it relates to antimicrobial drugs and describe the action of antiviral drugs that interfere with metabolism well certainly there are various kinds of of anti-metabolic agents that are available that includes your atovacuone okay this atovacuone this this skeletal formula shown in this slide is um, interfering the electron transport uh, in protozoa and your fungi well there are some examples like heavy metals which like arsenic mercury and um, antimony they will inactivate enzymes there that um, also agents that uh, disrupt tubulin polymerization and glucose uptake by many protozoans and parasitic worms there are also drugs that blocks the activation of viruses metabolic antagonists such as sulf um, sulfanilamide the first commercially available and uh, antimicrobial agent we have also uh, sulfanilamide in other similar compounds which we call them sulfona, uh, sulfonamides or the sulfa drugs they will also act as your anti-metabolic drugs because they are the structural analogs of um, that is chemically okay chemically very similar to 
your para amino benzoic acid or the PABA, the PABA. Okay, these are again the meta anti-metabolic action of your sulfonamides in inhibiting the nucleic acid synthesis. Uh, it, uh, the first image will show you the para-aminobenzoic acid and some of its structural analogs, the sulfonamides. We have here PABA and um, the sulfonamides. Okay, The analogous portions of the compounds are shaded in orange. Another B, we have the, the role or the metabolic pathway in bacteria and protozoa by which folic acid is synthesized from PABA. Okay, the role of PABA in folic acid synthesis in bacteria and protozoa, you have here the enzyme, the active sites, and they, they, they will produce this dihydrofolic acid. So, um, you'll see here the structure, okay, the, the, the flow. PABA will act on an enzyme that will produce an uh, dihydrofolic acid and that acts on an enzyme that for that f enzyme acts on forming the tetrahydrofolic acid there's an enzyme that will act on creating purines and pyrimidine nucleotides and they're an enzyme to produce the DNA and the RNA letter C you will see the inhibition of folic acid synthesis by the sulfonamides okay the presence of sulfonamides will deactivate the enzyme by binding irreversibly to the enzyme's active site. So there is, uh, the hydrofolic acid is not produced. These are the nucleosides and some of their antimicrobial analogs. The arrows will indicate the synthesis pathways. For simplicity, the, the nucleotides and analogs are shown without the phosphate groups that is okay they are depicted as nucleosides my question how do nucleosides analogs interfere with dna replication and rna transcription okay let's proceed with our next section the prevention of virus attachment entry or uncoating this figure on the background will show you a demonstration of a nasopharyngeal swab for the COVID-19 testing. So there are a lot of pathogens, particularly viruses, that attach to their host's cells via the chemical interaction between the attachment proteins on the pathogen and the complementary uh, receptors proteins on the host cells. And attachment of viruses can be blocked by what peptide and sugar analogs or either attachment or receptor proteins and when the analogs will block these sites viruses such as your COVID can neither attach to or nor they cannot enter on the host cells and the use of such substances are what we call as your attachment antagonists this is a very exciting new area of antimicrobial drug development and um, Plicornaril is your synthetic antagonist of the receptors of your Picorna viruses such as your cold, your cold viruses, polyviruses and your coxsackie virus. Okay, these drugs inhibiting or blocks the viral attachment and deters infections. There is also um, a very um, well-known antiviral, synthetic antiviral, the Aryldone. This Aryldone prevents the removal of polyvirus capsids, okay, the uncoating, and thereby interrupting the viral replication cycle. So this this part of this presentation will try to describe the action of antimicrobial attachment antagonists and of drugs that inhibit. The viral. And this is an image uh, that was created in JMOL showing the beta sheets and the alpha helices of your human rhinovirus. This molecule embedded in the hydrophobic pocket of the VP1 protein is your pleconeril. Even though some fungi and bacteria will commonly produce antibiotics, most of these chemicals are not effective for treating diseases because they are toxic to animals and humans. 
and they're too expensive and produced in minute quantities and they lack adequate potency. The ideal uh, antimicrobial agent to treat an infection or disease would be one that has all of these characteristics. First, they should be readily available. They are inexpensive. They are chemically stable so that it can it can be transported easily and stored for long periods of time. They should be easily administered. They are non-toxic and non-allergenic and they are selectively toxic against a wide range of pathogens. So these are some of the clinical considerations in prescribing your antimicrobial drugs. In the spectrum of action, okay, um, there, the number of different kinds of uh, pathogens a drug acts is against it will be known as your spectrum of actions. Drugs that work against only a few kinds of pathogens are in a narrow spectrum. We call it the narrow spectrum drugs, whereas those that are effective against many different kinds of pathogens are the broad spectrum drugs. So you will see here the, the spectrum activity of selected antimicrobial drugs for prokaryotes and the eukaryotes and also with the viruses. So, so um, the more kinds of pathogens a drug affects, the broader its spectrum of action. And the number of different kinds of pathogens a drug is again your spectrum of action. You will see here. Um, the mycobacteria, gram-negatives, gram-positives, the chlamydias, the rickettsias, protozoans, fungi, helminths, and and for the viruses, because they are not classified as living um, organisms. So now we try to see the effectiveness. Okay, to effectively treat infectious diseases, um, physicians would must know which antimicrobial agent is most effective against a particular pathogen. And to ascertain the efficacy of your antimicrobials, microbiologists will conduct a lot of tests, okay? Variety of tests. That includes what? Your diffusion susceptibility test, the minimum inhibitory concentration test, and your minimum bactericidal concentration test. We will compare and contrast this Diffusion Susceptibility Test, the E-Test, mic Test, and the MBC Test. We will define them one by one. What is Diffusion Susceptibility Test? They are also known as the Kirby Bars Tests. Okay? They involve uniformly inoculating a Petri plate with a standardized amount of pathogen in question. And we'll see here the small disk of paper that containing the standard concentrations of the drugs to be tested and firmly arranged on the surface of the plate. The plate is incubated. Bacteria will grow, reproduce, they will form a lawn everywhere except the areas where effective antimicrobial diffuse through the agar. And after incubation, the plates are examined for the presence of zone of like the zone of inhibition, which is a clear area, okay, where bacteria do not grow. And these are the zones of inhibition in the diffusion susceptibility Kirby Bauer test. Um, discs here are impregnated with an antimicrobial agent. In general, the larger the zone of inhibition around the discs, the more effective the antimicrobial drug drug is against the organism growing in the plate. The organism is classified as either susceptible intermediate or resistant to the antimicrobials tested based on the sizes of the zones of inhibition. So my question is if all of these um, antimicrobial agents diffuse at the same rate and are equally safe and easily administered, what do you think? Which one would be the drug of choice for killing this pathogen? You're right. The, 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 that is the drug on the uppermost disc. Next would be your minimum inhibitory concentration or your MIC test. 
Once the scientists identify an effective antimicrobial agent, they quantitatively express its potency as your minimum inhibitory concentration, often using the, mic um, the micrograms per ml. And as the name suggests, MIC is the smallest amount of drug that will inhibit the growth and the reproduction of your pathogen. The MIC can be determined through um, broth dilution test in which a standardized amount of bacteria is added to serial dilutions of antimicrobial tests in tubes or containing uh, the, the one that contains the broth. So this is your MIC test in turbid wells. Okay. So turbid and the clear well. So this is um, going to the right. It's increasing the concentration of the drug. And after incubation, again, turbidity or the cloudiness will indicate bacterial growth. The lack turbid, okay, the lack of turbidity indicates that the bacteria were either inhibited or killed by the antimicrobial agent. Um, again, dilution test can be conducted simultaneously. Okay, in your wells, these wells here. And with their ability measured by special scanners, they are connected to computers. Similar to the MIC test is what we call as your minimum bactericidal concentration test, the MBC test. Okay, your MBC test will determine the amount of drug required to kill the microbe rather than just the amount to inhibit it, as the MIC does. Okay, in an MBC test, samples taken from the clear MIC tubes or alternatively, we call we, from the zones of inhibition, from a series of fusion susceptibility test, and they will be transferred to a plate containing a drug-free growth medium. Okay, this is an uh, example. Okay, the MBC test, we have here the clear MIC tube put here, uh, we placed um, containing a drug-free growth medium. They are being inoculated with samples taken from the zones of inhibition or from the, again, clear MIC tubes after incubation. The growth of the bacterial colonies on a plate indicates that the concentration of antimicrobial agent or drug, in this case, is 8 per microgram per ml. And this is bacteriostatic. The lowest concentration for which no bacterial growth occurs in the plate is the minimum bactericidal concentration and in this case the MBC is 16 micrograms per ml. Now we will um, try to look for the um, discuss the route of administration. For your antimicrobial agent to be effective an adequate amount of it must treat the site of infection and for external infections such as your athlete's food okay infections and drugs can be applied directly this is known as your topical or local administration for internal infections drugs can be administered orally inter intramuscularly or intravenously okay each route has advantages and disadvantages and we will discuss the advantages and disadvantages of the different routes of administration of your antimicrobial drugs even though the oral route is the simplest okay it requires no needles and it could be self-administered the drug concentrations achieved in the body con uh, are lower than occurring via the other routes of administration further because patients administer the drug themselves, they do not allow to follow the prescribed timetables. You will see here the effect of route of administration on the blood levels of your chemotherapeutic agent. So um, oral, IM, the IV. Okay. Although IV and IM uh, administration will achieve higher drug concentrations in the blood, Oral administration has the advantage because of its simplicity. In addition to considering the route of administration, physicians must consider how the blood contributes to the antimicrobial agents to infected tissues. For example, an agent okay, removed rapidly from the blood by the kidneys might be the drug of choice 
for a bladder infection but okay would not be chosen to treat an infection of the heart and finally given that the blood vessels in the brain spinal cord or the eye are almost impermeable to many antimicrobial agents you know because of the tight um, structure of the capillary walls in these structures will uh, that creates the blood brain barrier infections that 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 there are often okay very difficult to treat now we will learn the safety and side effects another aspect of chemotherapy is that physicians must consider the possibility of adverse side effects and they fall into the three main categories toxicity allergies and disruption of your normal and uh, microbiota we will identify the three main categories of side effects of your antimicrobial therapy we will define therapeutic index and therapeutic range toxicity okay though antimicrobial drugs are ideally selectively toxic against microbes and harmless to humans many antimicrobials in fact have a toxic side effects and the exact cause of many adverse reactions is poorly understood but drugs may be toxic to the kidneys the liver or your nerves for example polymyxin and aminoglycosides okay they can be fatally toxic they can have fatally toxic effect on your kidneys not all toxic not all toxic side effects are so serious let's say your metronidazole or your flagyl which is an effective drug against a variety of anaerobic protozoans and bacteria they may they may cause harmless temporary condition called the black hairy tongue okay they will result in the breakdown of products of hemoglobin that will accumulate in the papilla of your tongue this image here is a uh, the black hairy tongue which is caused by the anti protozoan drug metronidazole and another thing is the discoloration of uh, the tooth enamel okay caused by tetracyclines again tetracyclines who should avoid taking tetracyclines very good tetracyclines are not um, should not be used by pregnant women and children again researchers are able to identify and estimate the safety of your antimicrobial drugs by calculating the drugs therapeutic index your ti which is essentially the ratio comparing the largest dose of a drug that is not toxic to the drug's smallest effective dose the higher the ti the safer the drug and clinicians refer also to a drug's therapeutic window which is the therapeutic window is a uh, um, the range of concentrations of the drug that is effective without being excessively toxic next con um, consideration is to the allergies okay in addition to toxicity some drugs trigger allergic immune responses in sensitive patients although relatively rare such reactions may be life-threatening especially in the immediate violent reaction called your anaphylactic shock and for example 0.1% of Americans have an anaphylactic re reaction to penicillin resulting in like 300 deaths approximately per year however not every allergy is to an antimicrobial agent is very serious A recent study that uh, indicates that penicillin frequently lose their sens sensitivity to it over time and initial mild reaction to penicillin need not preclude it's used in like treating future infections and lastly the disruption of your normal and uh, microbiota in some cases when the member of the normal microbiota is not affected by the drug it can become an opportunistic pathogen and they can overgrow causing a disease and for example long-term use of broad-spectrum antimicrobials often results in the explosion of the uh, the growth rate of your candida albicans in your vagina okay that was caused vaginitis or mouth thrush okay you'll see here the photo on the right is um, the multiplication of your clostridium difficile in the colon causing a potentially fatal condition called your pseudomembranous colitis 
This is a pathological specimen showing pseudomembranous colitis. Such opportunistic pathogens are of great concern. Why? Because for hospitalized patients, okay, or um, the one that got, that is causing nosocomial infections acquired from the hospitals, they are often not only debilitated and susceptible to opportunistic infections, but they are more likely to be exposed to other pathogens, okay, with resistance to antimicrobial drugs. And the top, that's the topic of our next discussion okay um, we will end this presentation by this clinical case study um, about a, a a soldier okay like his father and grandmother before him Ben is a marine surgeon and proud to serve his country he was nearing the end of his second tour of Jili in Afghanistan and was looking forward to returning home to his wife and his two sons. However, two weeks before he was scheduled to leave, Ben was seriously wounded in a suicide bomber's attack and almost lost his leg. He initially responded well to treatment, but three days into his recovery, his wound was obviously infected and it's getting worse. His doctors needed to act, it, to act fast. They prescribed him cephalixin, which is a semi-synthetic cephalosporin. The nurse swabbed the wound and sent sample to the lab for diffusion susceptibility test. There are some questions. What does the term semi-synthetic mean in reference to antimicrobial drug? What is the active site of the drug cephalexin cold? If the bacterium proves to be resistant to cephalexin resistance, what is likely due to what enzyme? And lastly, what is the other name for a diffusion susceptibility test? You may try to answer these questions and thank you so much again for listening to the first part of the uh, antimicrobial drugs and its effect on its the human body so up next we will discuss the resistance to antimicrobial drugs again thank you so much for listening and don't forget to hit like and subscribe to my youtube channel thank you and have a nice day